So my name is Taylor Brown. I'm a program manager on the Windows team. Um, my job spans a number of things, but I own uh, part of our developer strategy, so um, getting people to want to use Windows Server to build stuff on. Ultimately, that is my responsibility now. Um, so when people are, are trying to choose what platform to build on, um, it's my job to make them want to use Windows Server. Um, containers is a big part of that. Right? We've been really, really, really happy uh, since we shipped uh, Windows Server 2016 to see the adoption of, of containers from uh, the community. Uh, every morning I come in and kind of look at the, the trends and it's just been really, really cool to see that. And then we talk to a lot of customers who are really excited about what they're able to do with it. Um, and we're seeing a lot of really cool solutions come around, some of them being talked at, about here. Uh, there'll be some more tomorrow. Uh, so we're really excited about a lot of those things. I'm Dinesh Govindaswamy. I'm a dev lead in Windows Core Networking Group. I lead the charter for Windows Container Networking. So I'll leave this up for a moment. Um, I try to get out slides ahead of time so you can look at them. If you're sitting there and you look at the slides and say, yeah, this isn't really the talk for me, um, please go find another talk that is more relevant to what's, what you need from DockerCon. Uh, if this is the right talk for you, awesome. You're in the right place, and we'll go through all of it. At the same time, if you're going to go back and give a presentation to your colleagues or uh, go to a, a meetup, steal slides, please. They are there for stealing. Um, I have other slide decks on that same link from previous presentations. Steal them, too. Anything on there is fair game. Steal it. Use it. Um, help other people learn about this stuff. Um, that's why we're here. So, As we think about Docker uh, and Windows, one of the things that I should even start with when we titled this session, we weren't sure we were going to do the Linux demo today. So as we uh, finalized that, I was like, hmm, that title's a little bit interesting now. So what we're really not talking about here is Docker for Windows. The underpinnings of this is all the same for Docker for Windows, but the goal of this session isn't really to talk about Docker for Windows as a standalone entity. We're also not really talking about Linux on Windows. We'll talk a little bit about it, but that's not really the aim of this session either. And we're not really going to talk about Ubuntu on Windows, which is our Bash subsystem. That's really less of the, the goal of this talk, although there's a lot of uh, uh, complementary aspects to it. What we really want to talk about is the Docker engine as compiled for Windows using Windows APIs. Right? This is Windows containers, how Docker talks to Windows containers. And as part of that, how uh, Linux containers will come along. These are things that are available on Windows 10 today and Server 2016 today. Um, and then I've got a few sections in here we'll talk about what's kind of coming uh, as well. Right. So it wouldn't be a talk without a block diagram, so we've got a few of them. This is kind of the high-level architecture in, in Linux. Um, and you can certainly get into more detail than what I've got here, but this is a high-level overview of it. In the operating system, we have things like control groups and namespaces, um, layered file systems, and a whole pile of other kind of OS functionality that Containerd and the Docker engine uh, or RunC talk to. The Docker engine then layers on top of that, which has got its own set of uh, functionality inside of it, with a REST interface on top and then clients on top of that. Right? This is kind of the high-level architecture. When we contrast that with Windows, and I'll kind of flip back and forth a couple times, we notice that really all that changes is the bottom. We have a notion of a compute service that's sitting in the middle here, and then we have different versions or different names for the things underlying it. So we've had a notion of a control group in Windows since NT4. We call it a job object. Job object, is job is to collect a set of processes together and give you some common controls over them. Right? We've had that in, in, since NT4, and it's kind of been tweaked and modified in various versions uh, of the operating system since then, with the biggest uh, of those in 2016 as we added container support. Because a lot of our container support hinges off of this construct of a job object. We've had namespaces in Windows for a long time as well. We have what we call the um, object namespace. And the object namespace is where we collect all of these objects. And things are pointers to different objects. So if you go to C colon, in the kernel, that is not C colon. C colon is a, not a real thing to the kernel. It's actually global underscore question mark um, C is the actual object that it, it understands. Right, so we've had this notion of, of namespaces for quite a while. What we didn't have at all was a notion of a layered file system. That just did not exist at all. So we had to write a layered file system uh, and a layered registry. We had to write those pieces to it. Um, 
The reason we, wrote, we built this compute system on top was for two reasons. The first reason was that we saw what was happening in the Linux community already before Containerd came along where there was a lot of different implementations calling um, the control group interfaces. So what we feared was someday you're gonna have um, Docker running right next, next to Rocket next to some other thing, next to some other thing, and there's gonna be no common way to talk about these things at all. And so there's gonna be a really hard way to manage them. So we wanted to have one layer that was kind of a, here's the entry point to all things. The other reason was for Hyper-V isolation. So what is Hyper-V isolation? Well, we'll get into that in, um, in another slide. The compute service is our public interface to containers. Um, it, currently, it replaces Containerd. That will change as we uh, implement Containerd. Containerd will then call the compute service. But today, it's really kind of a floggable to Containerd. It kind of replaces that layer in, in the stack. Its job is to manage running containers. And running is the key term here. It doesn't understand anything about a container that's not started. It is stateless. You call it and say, start a container, here's the information, it runs that container. If the machine reboots, it has no idea what's going on. Right? That, is the, that is what the, the host compute service does. We also have a host networking service that Dinesh will talk about as well that is responsible for networking. And so a common, a common place. These are abstractions to low level capabilities. So we call the host compute service and say start a container. We don't go create a job object, create all of the things off of it. We give it that one definition and say go do that and then we implement the, the rest of that in the, uh, the host compute service. We have two different language bindings that uh, we maintain that are open source. The first one is the HCS shim. This is actually the shim that kind of goes between Docker and the host compute service. It's written in Go, uh, it's compiled in, uh, it's vendored in as a uh, vendor library. So you can use that or we also have a C sharp uh, version of it. Um, and it's named .NET Compute Virtualization and that's I guess because all .NET stuff has to have a long name. Um, so we maintain both of those. So we saw a little of this this morning, this one has a little more detail on it, but when we think about the host compute service, this is why we built that uh, in a lot of ways. So we can run a Windows Server container, that is a shared kernel. So if I run a second one of those, same kernel. They also share the same kernel with the host. Now we can run that in Hyper-V isolation, which we kind of talked about this morning, which means we're running a VM around it. Now the important part of this is the, it's the exact same container. Nothing changes, the container images are 100% compatible. All you do is add a flag and you run with this virtual machine. Now the host compute service gave us the layer to do that at. So literally Docker calls it with one different flag and we run it as a, um, as a, a VM instance. If you're running Windows 10, you're always using a Hyper-V container. The reason we did that is so that the kernel would be the same as what you're gonna run in production. When you wanna run in production, you can run it as a shared kernel container, a Windows Server container, or you can run a Windows Server container with this Hyper-V isolation. Why would you wanna run Hyper-V isolation in production? You've got a PCI requirement or some regulatory body that says I must have uh, hardware isolation. Well, you can check the box. Or you wanna run with a different version of the kernel. Or you wanna run uh, with some additional isolation for uh, some other reason, security or some other concern that you might have. Well, you pass the flag, you run as a Hyper-V container, and everything remains the same other than the fact that it's running in this VM. Now, when we talk about Linux, we wanna run the real Linux kernel. Why do we wanna run the li real Linux kernel? Because kernels matter. You may wanna run a different version of the kernel on different containers, you may wanna run a, um, a different distro, and you probably certainly wanna run a different kernel than the Windows kernel, because you're running a Linux container. So we give you a Linux kernel by virtue of the same mechanism, right? So this will allow us to run a real Linux container from the Docker Hub, pick your poison, any one of them you want, as a container on Windows side by side with other Windows containers. Right? And this functionality will be coming, um, you'll start seeing PRs in the, the public repos fairly soon. Uh, we'll start seeing Windows builds with uh, some of this functionality later this year. Um, I keep getting asked when is it gonna be available? When it's ready. Um, like, it depends on how much we work in the open community, how much uh, we can get done. Uh, if we get it done faster, it'll be ready faster. If it takes a little longer, it takes a little longer. What I don't want to do is give out something that doesn't work. So we talked a little bit about namespaces. Um, a namespace is an extension to a job object. We call them a silo. That's kind of our internal name for them. Um, a silo is what we hook onto that that uh, understands 
more about the, the underlying system. So more than just a set of processes, it understands things like the registry and process IDs and sessions. So if I go into a container and I say, give me all the processes, like get process, I only see the processes in the container, that's because we're virtualizing that away. Right, that's what we do on the silo side of it. Um, it also understands the object namespaces and file system and networking components. Now if you've been to previous Docker cons, we've talked a lot about these pieces and that earlier pointer will have more, uh, well, has a pointer to uh, the session John Starks gave on some of the registry and process stuff. What we're gonna focus on a lot today is the networking side of it. Um, so hopefully by like DockerCon 2018 or 2019, we'll have talked about processes, networking, storage, uh, Linux containers. Uh, we're just gonna need more DockerCons. <laughs> so with that, I wanna hand over to, to Dinesh so we can talk more about networking. Hello everyone. So for the past year, we have been working on improving our Windows platform to support Docker networking, specifically focusing on Docker Swarm on Windows. And we developed a network mode called Overly, and it's already available in Windows client and should be available very soon, like really soon in a matter of days in Windows Server 2016. With Overly network mode, you should be able to seamlessly run Windows and Linux, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so this wouldn't have been possible without the great collaboration we have with Madhu's team in Docker. And this is a great testament to um, Docker and Microsoft partnership. So in this segment of the section, we are gonna go over some Windows container networking basics and then uh, overview of network modes we have in Windows and how they compare against Linux and a cool demo of Docker Swarm running Windows nodes and Linux nodes. It's not the same as what Linux container on Linux kernel, it's a real Linux node, just to be clear. Docker networking is built on a, a set of networking fundamentals and we will look at one by one and how they compare against uh, Windows. Namespace, as Taylor talked about. Namespace in Windows is uh, TCP IP network compartments. Uh, compartments are basically a a logical container in TCP IP stack. The network layer in TCP IP is responsible for making sure that the compartment is completely isolated and packet forwarding between compartments is prevented. So this gives you a natural isolation for containers and all IP objects, interfaces, addresses, prefix, routes, everything lives inside that compartment. So it's a natural isolation for containers. The layer two routing and IP routing is done by Linux bridge and IP routing in Linux. In, in Windows, we use the Hyper-V virtual switch, which provides again a layer two uh, switching and layer three routing services. So in, in Hyper-V vSwitch, you can add the switch ports, dynamically add them and remove them. <laughs> and you can have multiple instances of the vSwitches and there are different kinds of vSwitch I'll be talking about in each of those network modes. And each instance of this vSwitch will have its own forwarding table and um, the sites are forwarding based on the MAC addresses and the VLAN tags of the packets. IP links, widths and IP links. In Windows, we add the network interfaces to this compartment. The network interfaces are corresponding to the containers. We add them to the compartment and then we bind this network interface to the corresponding switch port on the vSwitch. IP tables. IP tables provide rich packet filtering mechanism in Linux. In Windows, we use VFP. VFP is virtual filtering platform, which enables you to uh, basically apply a rich data plane primitive such as NCAP, DCAP, um, ACLing, stateful NATs on, pack, uh, on, act, on packets as actions. We also use firewall and uh, um, WFP for firewalling the containers. I hope this gave you a good comparison between how Linux networking building blocks compare with Windows networking building blocks. I'm pretty sure you guys have seen this diagram in multiple places. Um, I just want to highlight that the Docker networking architecture is built upon this um, container networking model. For Windows 2, all the constructs, sandbox, uh, endpoint, and network remain same, no changes. Even the Docker CLI options remain same. What we have done is we have done, we have written the Windows networking driver 
which is basically calling an abstraction layer called host network service. And the host network service is the layer that's responsible for setting up the container networking. That includes creating vSwitches, creating NATing, um, and then creating endpoints and binding them to the switch ports and applying policies on those endpoints. In the next few slides, we'll be going over all different networking modes and how they compare against Linux. The default network mode we have in Linux is uh, bridge mode. And the default network mode we have in Windows is NAT mode. So for NAT mode, we create a vSwitch called as internal vSwitch. The internal vSwitch is a private vSwitch with an addition of a gateway NIC to the host partition. And then we create a NAT between the gateway NIC and the external NIC. So any containers you added to this NAT network should be able to talk to each other because of the vSwitch. And any traffic that's going out of this NAT network will be NATed using the WinNAT. Let's take a quick uh, demo, quick look at a demo of the NAT network mode. This is a container host that I have in my Azure, Azure subscription. So I'm looking at the VM, and I have a default NAT network. And I currently don't have any containers running on this host. Let me take a look at inspect the NAT network. You can see that I have created a NAT network with an internal address prefix of this space. And this is my gateway. Now let's take a look at the host. So as you can see, I was telling you that you will be creating a gateway NIC on the host. So this is the gateway NIC that we created on the host. We have created an internal vSwitch. And we have also created a WinNAT between the gateway NIC and the external address space. This is the same address space that we programmed in the NAT network. Now let me go ahead and launch a container and connect it to this NAT network. So I'm inside a container, and you can see that I'm, I'm the one of the IPs that's assigned to this container is from the NAT internal address prefix that we saw earlier. And I'm able to ping external traffic from inside the container. So this, is, this gets NATed using the WinNAT that we have on the system. Now let me take a look at, I was talking to you guys about the compartments and the interfaces. So as you can see here, we have created a compartment for this container and we have added a network interface for this container and bind, bound that network interface to the switch port. Hope this gives you an um, understanding of how Windows networking for container works. Now let's go to the slides back. If you, want, if you want to expose your underlay network to the containers, then you'll be looking at the Mac VLAN mode in Linux. In Windows, uh, there are three different modes that give you the same um, exposure of underlay network to the uh, containers. So the three different modes are transparent, L2 bridge, and L2 tunnel. I'm just gonna give a brief overview of each one of them and how they differ with each other. In all these three network modes, we create a switch called as an external vSwitch. An external vSwitch is an addition to a, the internal vSwitch that we talked about in the previous slides. We also bind that vSwitch to an external NIC. So any containers connecting to this external vSwitch should be able to talk to the host partition and also to the external physical world, physical network world. So, and each vSwitch has its own forwarding table and they forward packets based on the MAC addresses and the VLAN tag. So that's how you're able to expose this underlay network to the containers. So the difference between the transparent L2 bridge network is that the, in transparent network mode, the containers MAC is placed on the physical network. So what this means is the physical network will be learning all your container MACs. If you're running transparent mode on a VM, make sure you're enabling MAC spoofing. Whereas in L2 bridge and L2 tunnel mode, we rewrite the containers MAC to the container host MAC. And this, this is more suitable for cloud environments like Azure and all the public cloud environments where you don't need to enable MAC spoofing. 
The difference between L2 bridge and L2 tunnel mode is that in L2 bridge mode, the container to container traffic will be bridged within the host, whereas in L2 tunnel mode, it will be tunneled to the external router and then harpen back to the destination container. The reason we do that is because we want to extend the fabric SDN policies to the containers. This is more suited for the public cloud environments. Now comes our uh, all sort uh, mode. So if you don't want to deal with your physical network constraints and if you want to stay away from them, then overlay network mode is your best option. Um, the overlay network mode in both Windows and Linux use the VXLAN data, VXLAN encapsulation. And it's, it's, similar, it's similarly implemented in Windows too. So you have two bridges in Linux, the Docker Gateway Bridge and the OVNet, and then you have two interfaces added to the container in Linux. Similarly, in Windows 2, we create two vSwitches, one as an external vSwitch and one the NAT, the internal vSwitch, and there will be two interfaces added to the container. I also want to talk about uh, service discovery and port publishing. This is very specific, uh, th this is a very important thing that we need to talk about. Docker has an embedded DNS server embedded as part of the Docker engine, and we use this embedded DNS server for service discovery, and we use it in NAT and overlay network mode. We use it a little differently than in Linux. So in Windows, what we do is we plumb the gateway IP as the DNS server IP to all the containers that we are launching. In addition, you can program all your external DNS servers. The Docker engine has the embedded DNS running on the container host and it is listening to, it is bound to all this gateway IPs and based on all the networks that you have in that container host. So I have uh, my service, which is basically having two tasks, dot four and dot five. The internal KV store of Docker engine is registered with those two uh, tasks. And from another client, with this, which is in the same network, I'm trying to curl to the service name, curl my service. The request comes to the Docker DNS server because the gateway IP is registered as the DNS server. And it finds, using DNS order, it finds one of the tasks and replies back with an IP. Now, if I'm trying to curl anything outside of my network, uh, like internet, docker.com, the, the query is gonna go to the DNS server, but the DNS server doesn't know about this um, service, so it's gonna reply with the e-fail, and then the client is gonna choose the next external DNS server and then send it to the external DNS server. One other thing before going into the demo, um, the port publishing. So Docker supports two modes of port publishing. One is routing mesh, and the other one is uh, host mode. Routing mesh is not yet available in Windows. We are currently working on it, but we do support the host mode port publishing. Basically on each host, you can publish the uh, port for the service that's running on that container host using the publish option and specifying the mode as host. Now with the port mode publish, you should be able to program your external load balancer to hit all this the host mode ports that are published and as your backend depths. And that's exactly what we are gonna demo now. So this is my another container host, and I've created a swarm cluster in a set of VMs from my Azure host. So I have a four node swarm. In this four nodes, I have two of them Linux nodes and two of them Windows nodes. So the swarm win master is a Windows and swarm win worker is a Windows, and the lin worker and the lint worker two are two Linux nodes. I have two services deployed. One is an IIS service, and another one is a SQL server. So I've developed an application, it's again a voting application. My front end is an IIS server, and a back end is a SQL Linux. So I'm running the SQL server on a SQL uh, Linux node. I have deployed one overlay network called OverlayNet, and I've connected my services to this overlay network. 
Now the SQL server is running only one instance and it's running in this swarm lin worker node. You can see this swarm lin worker node. And I have IIS which is running in 15 of them and it's running in between the Windows worker and WinMaster. Now a little look into the host. So as I was telling earlier, we create two gateway NICs, two switches. One is the internal NIC, which is for NAT network. And the another one is the external uh, switch that is for the OLA network. Now there are two V switches on the system. One is called internal NAT and the other one is called LAID Ethernet 2 for the OLA network. Now let's take a look into one of the container and then to service discovery. So this is, this is a container that's running IIS. So I'm looking inside this container and you can see that there are two interfaces added to this container. One connected to the NAT network. This 10.0 is our overlay network. And now let's, let me do the, resolve the DNS name for SQL Server. So this is resolving the Linux node, uh, the SQL Server service running in the Linux node, which is also running in the OLA network. Let me resolve this DNS name for IS. You can see that there are 15 instances of the IS running in the um, swarm and it can resolve all 15 of them. Now if I try to ping external traffic, like outside of the swarm, it's getting uh, natted using the NAT network. And as I was telling it, the, the, it hits the DNS server of the embedded DNS server in the Docker engine and then replies back and then it selects the external DNS server. So if you look at IP config all, you can see that I've programmed the external DNS server on the NAT network. Now the same thing with Windows networking, we create compartments for each container. So I'm gonna do a IP config all compartments. You can see there are 11 containers running on this host and you can see different compartments and their NICs added to each compartment. Now I, what I've done is I've taken this, I've published this port more, ports externally for IIS service. So these are the ports that are published to this IIS. And I've, one of my Linux node is running a NGNX load balancer. And I've created a load balancer to hit this external ports on the system. And I'm listening on 446. This is the IP, this is also on the same uh, network in Azure, Ho, Azure, in Azure VNet. So I'm hitting this IP comma port. So I'm hitting, sorry, one second. So I'm hitting this IP 172.16.0.6 comma 446. And this is my app, a simple app that's taking um, a voting app, vote for your favorite development environment, Windows or Linux. And basically, the, this is an IIS front end and this table is being pulled out from SQL Server. So it's, it's pulling the data from the SQL Server. So when I click this, you can see that this is where I've said what IIS instance we are servicing. So you can see that when I click the same load balancer, the backend is basically hitting different IIS instance and then showing the uh, load balancing. This is the demo of Swarm with uh, Windows and Linux nodes. Now going back to the slides. So this is a summary slide with all the different network modes that I have talked about and specifically highlighting the difference in terms of multi-host connectivity, service discovery, load balancing, and IP addressing. I just want to highlight one thing. As part of the requirements, if you, are, if you are gonna use the OLA network mode, make sure that the KB listed is available. And uh, I think it was, it was available as of last Tuesday. Just make sure it's available before you try um, OLA network mode in server 2016. With that, I would like to open up for Q&A. Questions? We will repeat questions, so as long as we can hear them. <laughs> uh, please wait for the mic. So if I made a Docker image on a Linux OS, can I use it seamlessly on Windows? You will be able to when we finish the Linux uh, work that we talked about today. That is exactly the goal of it, is that uh, any of the Docker images on the Docker Hub. So we pulled BusyBox today. Uh, we could have used any number of different ones, but that is exactly the goal. Yeah. So 
So two questions. Uh, your Nginx that was running on Linux? Yes, the okay. Nginx was running on Linux. Great. And then also you can talk a little bit about the performance implications of uh, WinNAT versus Overlay Network. Which one's better from a performance so standpoint? They are not, uh, WinNAT and Overlay are not competing. They are basic, you need both of them. The one difference is you're adding two interfaces to the container and one interface is being NATed and the other one is going over the overlay. We are working on some features where we can uh, basically use the same overlay NIC to also to do the NATing. So it's like bump on the wire NAT. So this is exposing another interface to do the NATing versus that will be a bump on the wire NAT. Thank you. Uh, so I have a crazy question. If I could use any Linux kernel, could I, because theoretically, could I uh, use SE Linux as a subsystem? Um, yeah, probably. So, because we're, what we're doing is we're basically working with the industries to, to bring those kernels along. Um, and so anything that you can do through Docker will be kind of the, the target. So any of the Docker configuration, you should be able to do. Now those kernel vendors can also roll their, their image we're calling it a container OS image for now, with whatever recommendations they have, which is kind of the intersection with Linux Kit, right? Giving you the best kind of environment around it. So, you know, we're, we're pretty open to, to different ways of doing it. Um. We're going to keep him busy today, aren't we? Uh, during the keynote, they talked about some new secrets infrastructure. Is that going to work on Windows as well? Yeah, we're working on it. Okay. Yeah. We actually have a PR already out for it. Hi, if, if I want to run a container uh, outside without Linux VM just on Windows kernel, mm -hmm. um, I use the Windows container API for that, and can I do that on Windows 10, or do I have to have server? So on, it's only on server that we use the Windows server containers with shared kernel. Um, the reason we're doing it differently on Windows 10 is that even though it's the same kernel between uh, Windows 10 and, and server, they operate differently. Um, and so you get different scheduling parameters, you get different um, memory management techniques. And so if you were trying to get to a, a state where you can say definitively this is going to run the same way, those will interfere with and change the way things work. Um, IAS is actually a good example of this. Uh, IAS does a lot of its routing in kernel mode, HTTP.sys. That behaves differently in Windows 10 than it does in server because the goals are different. Um, so that image would work differently in those different environments, which is kind of counter to the entire spirit and goal of of what we've done with Docker, uh, which is why we implemented it the way that, that we did, at least for now. Um, as we move more and more things into user mode, which is kind of the, the direction everything's going, so you see this in the .NET um, uh, core work, for example, everything's moving to K and running things in user mode. As we do that and we separate uh, that boundary more and more, I could see possibility for that, uh, that changing, but we're trying to be really careful to make sure that we keep that consistency first. And then we're also making Hyper-V containers faster and more dense, that's the other big uh, objective. Can you say any more about um, when you might have the routing mesh? A part of run, uh, routing mesh availability. Uh, so yeah, routing mesh is not yet available. So basically we don't have the native way of load balancing containers for, nat native way of load balancing for containers, we are working on it, should be available in the next uh, upcoming months. Was there a specific question about how, how we are doing it or? I think it was just when. Okay, <laughs> it's next in a couple of months. All right, any other questions? This is kind of a layer above what you were talking about, but I know that some features um, like the ability to squash images and whatnot are not yet available in Windows or at least weren't yeah. checked. Um, are you working on that or are other people or? Well, we want everyone to help as much as sure. they can. Some of them we have to do in, the, in Windows, right? There's things that we're just going to have to do in Windows that only Windows can do. Um, but there's an awful lot of stuff that can actually happen outside of Windows. So folks like John Howard that are working in the Docker projects and Containerd certainly can use help on, on various pieces of it. And we're hoping that people uh, will uh, jump in on that, as they have already. Um, the things that we're working in in the kernel, our goal is to get to, to parity. And it's going to be incremental steps along the way. Um, so, like, overlay was a big step towards networking parity. Well, we still have routing mesh that we need to work on. Um, the ability to, um, to do some of the, the same uh, storage uh, functionality, storage plugins and some of those things. 
we know we've got some gaps there that we're working on on trying to close as quickly as we can. Um, but an awful lot of it is just things that we just need to, to implement. Um, storage plugins, for example, like most of the, the required stuff is there. It just needs to be uh, implemented in, uh, and pushed out. Uh, hi, um, I'm just wondering what sort of works in progress to improve the support on Kubernetes, um, specifically having more than one container being able to run in a pod and yeah. things like Simlink and such? Yeah, good question. Do you want to talk about the pod one first? Yeah. So we, we I don't know the timeline was, Jason might clear, clear me, like correct me if I'm wrong. So we already have the support for running uh, multiple containers in a pod in the Windows client. If you're um, in yeah. RS2 or the, with the creators update. It's only Windows Server containers. Okay. Yeah. So there's two different, uh, with Hyper-V containers versus Windows Server containers, two different answers. It's really easy, well, I shouldn't say really easy. It's okay. easier to do in Windows Server containers because they share a kernel. Hyper-V containers, and we have to support multiple containers per, uh, per VM, which is what we're gonna do. Uh, but there's extra work involved in doing that. So Windows Server containers, we've got a prototype of that done yes. that we're gonna add into the next version of Windows, which we'll be talking about in a couple weeks about the, how that's coming along. Um, so that'll get us the first part of that. Then the second part of that will follow shortly thereafter. Um, Simlinks, we've got some work to do there as well uh, that we're gonna try to get in for, for this uh, turn of the crank. So it's a journey. Thank you. So in that uh, demo that you did, you, for the services that you had Nginx load balancing across, I noticed you published the port for all of those services. Yes. Was that required for Nginx to be able to access them, or could you do it without that? You can do it without that. Cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, I think we got time for one more, if there's one more question, if not. So, um, one more question. so with the route mesh on the Linux boxes, would that work for the Nginx proxy even though it's in a Windows Swarm? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So for example, if you publish that 443 for that Nginx proxy and you had the two Linux workers, could you use the route mesh even though the Windows manager? Yes, yes. You can still use a routing mesh on Linux nodes, yes. All right. All right. So thank you, um, Taylor and Dinesh. Let's give them another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.